bad sign. And, um, and a few months after that, um, Russia defaulted, devalued, um, and my fund went from a billion dollars to 100 million. And I can tell you that there were no more invitations to go to anyone's yachts after that. It was a very public humiliation, and the most significant part of this public humiliation um, <clears throat> uh, was that uh, I was, the, I, I was the, the Russia guy. I was the, the main guy investing in Russia, and so I was the main guy who lost money in Russia, and I was determined to climb out of this hole that I got myself into. But the problem was um, that the oligarchs who owned majority stake in the companies that I had invested in were determined to steal all the money left in these companies. And so I ended up with my 10 cents on the dollar looking at, at one of the largest um, orgies of stealing that there ever was. And I decided because I was gonna climb out of this hole that I was gonna fight the oligarchs when they tried to steal from us. And the most famous fight that, that I was involved in um, was with the company Gazprom, which is the largest gas company in the world. Gazprom traded at a 99.7% discount to Exxon and British Petroleum per barrel reserves in 1999. The reason it was so cheap was that the market believed that management of Gazprom had stolen every single asset out of the company and there was nothing left. And so I looked at this thing and I said to myself, is it possible that, they, that they've stolen every single asset out of this company? And I thought, probably not, but how would we prove it? And so I got together with my team of analysts and we decided to do a stealing analysis of Gazprom. Now they didn't teach stealing analysis at Stanford Business School. And so what we ended up doing was we ended up setting up breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, coffee, dessert, with anybody who knew something about the stealing of Gazprom that we thought might talk to us. Competitors, customers, suppliers, um, ex-employees, government officials, et cetera. And, and it was amazing how many people said yes to these invitations. And what was even more amazing was how much information people shared with us during these meetings. Russia, during the communist time, the, the wealth disparity, the richest person was six times richer than the poorest person. But by this point in time, in 1999, the richest person was 250,000 times richer than the poorest person. And that kind of disparity created over a period of five or six years poisons the psychology of a country. And because nobody had participated in this wealth accumulation other than a very few people, the people who didn't participate were really angry. And every time we took them to lunch, they wanted to share their anger and vent and tell us exactly what they knew about who was doing what to whom. And we filled up two notebooks full of notes about stealing a gas prom. And then the question was, how do you actually verify whether this stuff is true? And the, the next interesting facet of Russian culture is that it's the most bureaucratic country in the world. Everything that happens there gets filed in quadruplicate. And all that stuff gets filed and then, and then put into a database by some poor database operator in some ministry on the edge of Moscow. And my head of research figured out that all these people really wanted to go to nice lunches and have people ask them what they do for a living and share information. And so he started taking these people out to lunch and they started sharing their databases with him. And as a result, we were able to get the Customs Committee database, the uh, Moscow Registration Chamber database, the, securities and the Federal Securities Commission database. And with these databases, we were able to then prove and disprove what people had told us during these meetings and we learned the most amazing thing. Um, we learned that the management of Gazprom, nine individuals had stolen an oil company the size of Exxon out of Gazprom over a four year period in the late 1990s. It was the largest heist in the history of the world. Nine guys, an oil company the size of Exxon. Oil reserves as big as Kuwait had been stolen by nine guys. Now, so no wonder people were um, upset with Gazprom and valuing it real low. Um, but the other discovery we made is that an oil company the size of Exxon only represented 9.65% of Gazprom's reserves. More than 90% of the company was still there. So the market was valuing at a 99.7% discount, and we've determined that it really should only trade at about a 10% discount. So what do you do with that information if you're an investor? Well, what we did was we made it their single largest investment in our fund. We made it 30% investment in our fund. And then we did something which was truly 
unique, unprecedented, and led to a complete an utter amazing disaster, um, which was we then took that information and we shared it with the international media. We gave a chap we made it broken into seven chapters, gave a chapter to the Financial Times, a chapter to the New York Times, a chapter to the Wall Street Journal, et cetera. And they just devoured it. They devoured it, they printed it, and it created a political crisis like you've never seen before. All of a sudden, the, the parliament had to start debating whether it's good or bad to steal 10% uh, of Gazprom. The, ma the management were forced into bringing in Price Waterhouse to do an audit. Price Waterhouse had been the auditor while this was going on. The minority shareholders brought in their own auditor. And pretty soon, um, uh, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, stepped in and fired Rem Vyakarev, the chairman of Gas or the CEO of Gazprom, and replaced him with a guy whose job it was um, not to steal any more assets and to recover the assets that had been lost. Just with that replacing of the CEO, the share price doubled. And over the course of the next six years, the shares went up 100 times. 100 times. Well, you can imagine um, if, if that, uh, the, the inspiration of, of that experience for me, and so we did the same thing at the electricity company then at the National Savings Bank, then at three oil companies, then at a chocolate company, then at the oil pipeline company. And it was just working beautifully, this, this strategy. And the reason that it was working was because Putin was fighting with the same guys we were fighting with. They were stealing money from us and stealing power from him. And so every time we would publicize something, they would step in and do something. It was just beautiful. Things couldn't have been better. My fund grew to more than $4 billion. I was the largest investor in Russia. Um, we were up 35 times from the day we started, even with that collapse. It was just the most beautiful situation. And we were also making Russia a better place by stamping out corruption. And so I didn't notice something which happened, which I should have noticed, which was at the end of 2003, Putin arrested the richest man in Russia, a man named Michael Hordakovsky, the head of Yukos. And they put him in jail. If you were the 17th richest guy in Russia and you saw the richest guy sitting in jail, what's your natural reaction? Well, you don't want to be sitting in a jail cell yourself. And so one by one by one, all of the oligarchs in Russia came and pledged their allegiance to, to Vladimir Putin. And when, when they did that, the oligarchs then no longer were um, an enemy to the regime, they were partners with the regime. And I was still naming and shaming them. On November 13th, 2005, as I was flying back to Russia after having lived there for 10 years, having more than $4 billion invested in their country, largest foreign investor, they stopped me at Sheremetyevo 2 airport, arrested me, put me in the detention center of the airport, kept me there overnight, and then deported me back to London where I had originated on the flight. Shortly thereafter, they named me a threat to national security, took my visa away, and told me never to come back to Russia. I was very upset with that decision, um, but it turned out to be nothing compared to what happened next. 18 months later, the Moscow tax police raided my office in Moscow with 25 officers, and 25 more officers raided the offices of my law firm called Firestone Duncan, an American law firm, with the specific task of grabbing the corporate documents, the certificates of registration of our companies. Once they got those documents, we learned that three months later, those companies had been re-registered out of our name into the name of a convicted murderer named Viktor Markelov. So the police took our documents, and all of a sudden, a convicted murderer owned our company, having used the documents the police took. At this point, we hired a number of lawyers. We hired seven lawyers from four different law firms to help us uncover what had happened. And in particular, we hired a young man named Sergei Magnitsky, who worked at Firestone Duncan. He was a 36-year-old tax lawyer to head up the investigation into what was going on. And he determined the most remarkable thing. It turned out that not only had the police stolen our companies, but they used the same documents that they had taken to create a bunch of backdated, forged contracts to claim that our companies owed a billion dollars to three shell companies that had been newly formed. 